from the beginning. That is the first slide. Everyone now is good. Uh, that I will. Well, now you are in some kind of presentation mode. Ah, you yes. Have screens. Uh, the little one and the big one. Uh, this is better. Yeah. Okay. So a bit about the context then again. Um, the idea is that if you want to have a really precise or if we want to have like agents, intelligent agent behave in a human like manner, we need to have a really precise or exact digital representation. So a very nice high level digital model. But of course, if we use reality capture devices, we go from the real world uh, to the low level digital model, which is mainly special. And through some additional transformations like information injection and so on, we can get this high level digital model. Uh, and when I talked about reality capture devices, of course, uh, why don't we use directly or more directly within this workflow point cloud? So many there are three problematic. And the first one is, uh, let's say, point cloud specificities. If we look here at the video, we see some problems of misadjusted density, clutter, occlusion, random errors or systematic errors and so on, uh, which can cause problems down the line for using it efficiently. The second thing is, of course, the representation and the structuration. Uh, with 3D data, we have various ways to represent or structure the, the, the underlying data. Uh, and as you can see here, it's a voxel rendering of the underlying point cloud. And each of the 3D data representation and structuration has limits and advantages. So that's something interesting because uh, the point cloud is actually a canonical data where we can map or with more or less success, all this 3D data representation, like a 3D mesh or parametric model, a depth map, and so on. Um, and the third problem with point cloud is automation. And that's, let's say, the major one, right? And if we, I take a classical progressing from acquisition to application, we try and automate in research at each of the steps uh, and have more efficient workflow. Like here, we can see the automation for the, for the UAV to acquire automatically the data. Here, we can see uh, trying to have automatic filters to filter noise or things like this. At the registration step, we want to assemble different position in one common frame of references. Uh, this part, which is maybe where I'm the most active and that would be my favorite if I have to pick one is segmentation because I believe a lot of uh, different um, automation can be solved by having some kind of segment information beforehand. And then after this, we have the classification where we will group several segments together, for example, to get an idea of uh, an attached semantic information, like a label, like the wall, the door, the beam, and so on. Then we have the structuration automation, how to create automatically structure for visualization or processing and here we can see the nice uh, pottery platform and i'm really looking forward uh, to what uh, marcus will be presenting next week of course <clears throat> and here we have the application where in this uh, example uh, we try to have an automatic um, or not an automatic this is manually for surveyors they want to extract let's say a flow plan based on the underlying point cloud data and having some kind of automation here will be course nice so these three things are challenges toward uh, better integrating the point cloud in this uh, workflow toward high level application and the, the the main struggle of course for getting this high level is how can we integrate semantic and knowledge within this data set so what's happening today uh, is that we have a point cloud as a support mainly and uh, we will have the expert uh, behind the computer that has knowledge and he will use the point cloud to extract a product like a, a floor plan, a mesh or a simulation. And uh, what we want is to integrate directly this knowledge within the point cloud to have a semantic representation that we can act on directly through automatic uh, reasoning based on information extraction. But the problem here is of course, how can we extract and integrate this knowledge within this point cloud for autonomous decision-making system. And let's say uh, the, the first big direction is given here. Uh, it's based on the smart point cloud infrastructure or architecture that address mostly from segmentation to application automation. And the point cloud that you can see down bottom uh, will be ingested by the parsing module that will, let's say, uh, create some clusters and so on to be uh, fed through the database module where everything gravitates around. 
So I will first speak uh, about main, maybe this database module where we think about how to structure the data and the knowledge and the lying list, which is really interesting topic and gather a lot of perspectives from different communities, which is always nice, I believe. And here are the ideas, of course, um, if we look at point clouds, uh, in 99% of the cases, one point does not describe an object in itself, and an object in itself is not described by only one point cloud. So thus, attaching a semantic attribute per point is not the most pertinent manner. Rather, grouping elements as a block storage model seems really, uh, really nice. And of course, that is of par with all the database management system where a per row insertion is not really efficient. And here the idea of what drive everything is this uh, conceptual meta model, which is driven by three layers. And the more you are in the gray uh, here, the more you are uh, far away from the high uh, level model. And here, of course, you are really close to our domain concepts. So the point cloud here is mostly described at the meta model level zero, the generalized SPC meta model. It's mostly the geometry and the attributes. Here it's a layer that make the interface between uh, the very low clustering or the semantic patches with the domain ontology that we specialize. So basically we formalize uh, domain knowledge into some kind of computer usable um, thing that can be for reasoning services. And here you can see that the knowledge drive everything through a decomposition between device that is related to the sensor and so on, analytic, mostly extracted from features or things that do not at this step um, use any domain information and all domain knowledge. What is really nice in this architecture is we have this bijective communication between different, um, how can I say that, let's say level of detail or generalization level where one point is the smallest entity and several points will constitute a semantic patch Several semantic patch will constitute a connected element. Let's say that will be maybe the seat of a chair. Several connected element will constitute an aggregated element. So the seat of a chair, the legs of the chair, and the backrest will constitute an aggregated element, and that will be uh, called a chair through the class instancing. Um, right, but to get these different clusters, of course, we, we need to talk a bit about the parsing module that is acting under underlying this. Uh, architecture or infrastructure. And that's based on the guest style theory, which states that the world is greater than the sum of its part, and that relationships between parts can yield new properties or features. So here we really want to leverage the human visual system predisposition to group sets of elements. And if I illustrate this here, for us it's really easy to, to define the visual patterns of points, right? They make intuitive sense like uh, symmetry or parallelism or linearity. But here, if you want to create this feature uh, through feature engineering, you can have a lot of problems, not as straightforward. So here, deep learning is much more efficient because it can create feature much more distinctive without so much uh, brain power, let's say. But of course, before going into directly this uh, all solve a solution, we have to check out the underlying data sets. And of course, with point cloud data sets, there are not a lot of really nicely created data sets with nice labels and uh, representing all the different applications. So that is where feature engineering is better because you can uh, have this first step toward having a nice set of uh, nicely labeled data sets beforehand before using any deep learning technique. And here, what is uh, constructing is it is unsupervised in the sense that there is no training data needed, but also in the true sense that it's truly unsupervised, no parameter tweaking. Because if you tweak some parameters, of course, it's supervised in a manner uh, to get, uh, let's say, the con connected elements, and then afterward to get uh, a graph based classification that I will talk a bit more uh, afterward. So if we look at that on this data set, you can check some. Uh, results here and basically the idea is to um, to to use the predisposition or, or let's say the planar dominance of scenes and then to find and extract some kind of topological pointers between each of those elements to have a graph representation of the point cloud or the point cloud as cluster so as connected element and we can reason based on this so we have today more or less 10 million points per minute 
but uh, I took the direction of not using the GPU, so it's all done only on CPU calculation. So you can expect, of course, to use jumps if we switch a bit more. Um, but yeah, what is important here is to see the features. So there, there is a bunch of local features, uh, mainly derived from uh, uh, principal component analysis, but not a lot. And uh, what is really important when we look at it is all what is context and proximity features, which are really nice and helping. And all the relationship and topology uh, also very, very helpful, like the relationship between host and guest and things like this. Uh, which is based on geometrical generalization of the underlying clusters. And all of this is knowledge driven. So basically we could, we can use directly uh, the graph representation of the point cloud with an ontology and get prediction. Um, and that is also playing with this step because of the ontology or, or formalizing domain as ontologies using Sparkle or, or, or other like all languages. Uh, it's nice because you can use automatic resonors uh, that will then create or find your pattern automatically. So let me illustrate this. Uh, we have this classified entity through the pipeline that I described, and we have this classified entity where you see the chair in yellow, right? And uh, what we do here then is we isolate the object the chair, but of course here with the ontology we can deepen the th the automatically through rezoning the specification. So if we link that to the semantic web with this technology, we can have the formal description of a chair. So here it's in French, but uh, it is in your, uh, let's say, regional language. And um, the definition is an extension of the DBPDR knowledge base. And basically here what I did is just parse this uh, manually but we could imagine having some kind of natural language processing to have that automatically and then create this ontology that describes what is a chair and you see that we can refine this description with this seat, the backrest and the legs. So now this uh, chair goes, if you remember, from the aggregated element concept to all the sub elements, right? So it's an aggregated element and now we can go through a part segmentation framework to extract all the underlying elements following this ontology. And then with other features like symmetrical features and so on, you get the, <clears throat> the characterization refinement. This is very nice because then you can play uh, with the different representations through this canonical nature to have more information like intersection or proximity to the table and things like this and extract, uh, let's say, a semantic representation that will be uh, analog analogous to our visual cognition system. That's what we act on, right? So if I need to answer, if I want to answer this uh, question uh, in a simple manner, I would say that if you want to use that in this high level model, you need first to have a multi-level conceptual structure and of course parse the point cloud at the lowest possible level and be able to plug a domain formalization through an ontology of classification and of course generating a modular semantic representation for various applications because um, else you are too specific or too narrow in your application and that's where ontologies are really nice because it's interoperability uh, capabilities permit to generalize much uh, more easy, uh, easier uh, easily than uh, deep learning framework or machine learning framework. And that's an example of an application. Let's say here, uh, surveying what's back in 2015, I think, a church in France. Um, combining that with some kind of photogrammetry, we get this uh, reality capture data set. And the idea was uh, the archaeologists wanted to know exactly how many goals or renovated gold tesserae was there. So we developed an application to automatically compute the best point of view based on automatically detected uh, uh, tesserae. And that's interesting because, of course, then she can order the right amount of uh, goals for restoring this, uh, this small um, mosaics. And so that's a digital protection application. And the second possibility, and that's with my current PhD student, Abdel Razak, that we do this where we can ingest that in VR application by using, or there is a mistake in application, by using directly, let's say, the semantic attributes, which is really nice, or in an augmented reality application, like you see on the right with a prototype um, work, which we are working on at the moment. 
Okay, so now discussing a bit about the smart point cloud and five point, why is it nice? Because mostly it's an interoperable point cloud data structure. Um, that is, sorry for the slide, that is really important. Then it's leveraged for automated object detection, of course. It provides uh, a large domain connectivity. So if you have a domain connect formalization, you can just attach it and have your uh, prediction. It's for now unsupervised and very robust variability, but most importantly, it's really modular. So we can, all the blocks that we saw before, we could, let's say, extend them with better, more, better performing uh, elements. So here is an example of the application. We select elements, like the connected element, and then we can attach the information, like this is a table of conference. And then we can select other things, like isolating all the elements that we do not want to display, for example. And then having all the automatic inference uh, run through, and you can see here all the instance segmentation happening. And then you can select, of course, all the chairs and do some bunch of uh, operation on it and have the classification uh, display as well. So it's also nice to have like an annotation tool to get a, a really fast uh, data sets, annotated data set. So, um, what would be, let's say, the future direction that I would uh, think of right now? So the first off is, of course, defining powerful uh, AI agents that can use that is a nice direction. The second thing is increasing uh, generalization and specialization is really important. Of course, it was tested in the context of a PhD thesis, so you can imagine it's always limited to a bunch of uh, things that you have in mind when you create this research. Uh, the third thing is, of course, having some kind of dynamic integration, so temporal integration and a better level of detail management that is not um, too grid-like grid structured. And enhancing the unsupervised segmentation, that's what I'm working on right now, and I will show you some examples and the classification as well. And, of course, integrating more natural processing, uh, like language parsing or things like this. So here are some examples of the unsupervised um, segmentation where you can see that it's really nice and it generalizes quite well to different scenes with different varying density and so on. And uh, here is another example with other possible um, scenes. So that is really encouraging. And here, but I think uh, Pierre Allier will have a much nicer things here about the 3D modeling. So basically using the segment information directly to model, and you can see how nice are the trees here uh, to get an, an idea of the performance. The point cloud here is 100 million of points, and you get um, this result, the, the, the segmentation run under 10 minutes, and the modelization run for 300 seconds. Exactly. The topology is totally wrong and messy, but uh, I like it. It's quite uh, artistic, let's say, <laughs> at this point. Um, and of course, I want to leave you with this to see all the depth that we can use Point Cloud with. And here is a fun experiment uh, playing with uh, in real time uh, different Point Cloud and setting them inside one another to see that we can really access a very uh, nice possibilities if we can, of course, fix uh, some of the uh, challenges that I expressed here. And that is a good news for researchers because there is a lot of work and a lot of place for us to, to do some, uh, some nice stuff. Uh, last thing maybe is if you want to contribute to a special issue, uh, here there is one automatic feature recognition from point clouds where we aim at gathering uh, targeted to feature extraction and recognition and things like this. It's up to the 30 September. If you have nice research work you want to submit, please uh, do so. Um, and that's it. I hope it was fluid enough uh, and that I was straight to the point. Sorry for, 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 for all no, the no, no. I did. Perfectly hearable in the second part. So it was a, a big improvement. Thanks for uh, presenting. Are there any questions from the audience? Quick questions. Any questions? Okay. Please let me know if you have any questions. If not, we try to switch as quickly as possible to uh, the second presentation by Robert Vouten. 
we will look at indoor point clouds. One more attempt. Are there any questions? So I see one question. So what database infrastructure do you use? Um, so you is using uh, PostgreSQL and PostGIS for the database model. So actually relational database for all the point cloud storing, but uh, the PG point cloud extension really help you handle a big amount of, or let's say large scale point cloud if you have this block storage model uh, vision. Okay, Floral, well, thank you very much. And sorry for the uh, interruption by switching to a different video platform. I hope the audience could catch the uh, main message of the smart point cloud uh, approach. I would now like to give the floor to uh, Robert Fouten, uh, who will give the second presentation on indoor point clouds and applications. Robert? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Well, I can well skip who I am, but I work both at uh, at CGI and uh, as a guest researcher at the University of Delft. But let's skip for now. Um, I think what um, what my intention of this presentation is that for all kinds of indoor stuff, uh, we want to have a an, an replication of the indoor environment, and what we see that normally. Uh, people say, okay, you can use a BIM, but we see that many, many buildings just don't have a BIM. And there we found out that mobile laser scanner is at least a very attractive way to gather the indoor environment because it's really fast. And I think the, the whole idea of speed is an important part of my presentation. So how can we gather the data that we want to use of the indoor environment in a very efficient way? Um, so, uh, look at it, then in the end, of course, we might want to have an indoor GML uh, or at least a description of the indoor environment with a, a network that you can use for navigation uh, or for transportation within the building. It doesn't always have to be uh, a person on uh, a walking person. It can, can be also somebody else or something else. But what we see now that when we start with uh, the point cloud that we gather from the indoor environment we do a lot of processing and then we store the data and then afterwards we want to use it and what we try to find out in, and also in this presentation is how can we directly use this data or at least as fast as possible and I will go to that in the end of my presentation um, so it's all about this processing how are we going to process the, the point class that we uh, that we gather and if you look at that, I start off with a uh, an, uh, an algorithm that was, I think, in 2015, 2016, being designed at the University of Delft by a group of students, and we made a publication about that. And what's important is that we uh, try to find a very efficient way of describing the indoor environment, not by looking at all the objects or walls or floors, but just by looking at all the places where there is nothing. And, um, and you can, as you can see on the right diagram, then you see a path taken by means of a person walking on stairs, or not, maybe not a path taken, by, but a potential path. If you look at all the places in the, uh, in the area, in the point cloud where we don't see points. And uh, for that, we use the octree, so it's hierarchical uh, con construction to be able to find out where you try to uh, enrich it with some semantics. Uh, floor stories, staircases, all these things have been added by, uh, by several, um, several uh, new researches that we've done. Um, and as also seen in the last presentation by Florent, um, it's interesting to think uh, in voxels because voxels have, of course, they degrade your model, but they also have an advantage. Where you look at voxels, it might be interesting to see that they um, have a, uh, a lower amount of data and uh, they simplify your model as well. So it, it can be in, uh, productive in two ways. So this is the way we capture the environment with a mobile laser scanner. Uh, this is of course part of the university building in Delft. And here you see the point clouds 
um, and also how we do this process. So we make the point cloud with the mobile laser scanner there and we add the trajectory of the person that walked in this area. Also, of course, the trajectory itself contains information. Um, and here we add the two into one. And maybe I should go a little bit slower because I'm not sure how the video stream updates. Uh, and here you see the algorithm displayed in a few simple steps. Um, you see the, the, the voxels. And then what you see, we add the trajectory. And then what we're going to do to classify the floor in, uh, in three different colors, as you see here. But blue is, is a horizontal, uh, red is a staircase, so with a higher angle, and green is a slope with a lower angle. Um, and that's already important in, if you think about uh, how can we navigate in this indoor environment. Uh, a person on a, in a wheelchair can probably use blue and green, but cannot use red. So that's already a, a short a sort of classification that might be very interesting. Um, then we uh, remove uh, dynamic objects. So you can see in this point cloud, you see that the person that was walking with uh, the scanner, but maybe also a person that was walking next to him, are still there in this point cloud, although this is already the voxelized space. Maybe you cannot see it, but it's, that's what it is. Um, and then we use the seed voxel, so we lower the trajectory onto the, 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 the ground voxels uh, to be able to find out these different colors or segments, as, as I said. Um, and then we try to do some region growing to fill in the gaps that we didn't scan um and in the end we get well a rather nice uh, picture of the navigable space and also as set in these different colors or well, if you distract the rest and you see this um this is the final diagram of this area so it's 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 looking like an outdoor terrain but it's in fact it's an indoor terrain it used to be outdoor there but it's now an indoor and then we retrieve the walkable space Okay, and then we want to go into this idea. We want to segment the, uh, the walkable space in different rooms. And um, therefore, we also have a look at doors. And then, of course, in the end, you will get a network like this. And to be able to do that, we use the medial access transform and a, a, a research done by Rafi Peters, and we extended on that. And then we use that to uh, get walls um, and because in walls the doors could be detected because we have the tra trajectory going through the wall uh, to be able to find the doors um, and then in the end uh, we create all these different spaces uh, which are important but if you look at in a gml you need to define the spaces and subspaces and the, and the network graph of course um, so here we see the connectivity graph. It's not completely right yet. So there we add the middle access transform um, to find uh, the, the nice uh, uh, points in the in the graph where we or the nodes uh, where where all the parts of the graph are being connected. So and then in the end we get a rather nice result of the same area, it's still the same area that I started off in, uh, with in the beginning. And here you see that we also added the stairs and slopes in, a, in, in, in different colors where the nodes are connected to, to those floor spaces. Um, so I think that was uh, what we've done with uh, the point clouds and the navig navigable space and the network graphs so far. And, um, but I said it's really important to go into speed. So this is all processes that run afterwards so you collect the data and then you do the the, the processing of the data in, in, in a separate process um, and um, well we are not there yet if you look at the complex area like this in a in an airport you see that a micro navigation might be very important and very difficult to have a look at and it might be not as important as you think because you could say, okay, if I'm here and I need to go to the other side of this hallway, then I probably find a way I will take one of the different routes. Um, but sometimes areas are a little bit more comp complex than this one, and then, then uh, especially important to find in these open spaces, the open areas, 
the most efficient routes that you can take. Um, so, but now we go on to uh, the next step, and this is the research that's going on right now by another student and that we are uh, working with. Um, this is all about real-time scanning of the environment and real-time usage of the data. So it's we scan and share it uh, in the same same moment of time. So, well, I have a short movie of this uh, study. What we've done, we used uh, a HoloLens to acquire this data. So now we don't scan with a mobile laser scanner, but with a HoloLens. And that's a little bit strange to uh, to re make a re remark on because normally a HoloLens is seen as an AR device in which you have extra data that can be uh, uh, given to the users. And the HoloLens uses SLAM, of course, to find its own location. But in this situation, we only used the SLAM procedures of the HoloLens to acquire a, a picture of the environment. I must say that in this situation, of course, we don't collect a point cloud, but a mesh. But we all know that we can go from a mesh to a point cloud if we want to. But in this real-time environment, uh, we decided to, to stick with the mesh and to use the mesh to calculate all kinds of stuff. And here you see a small movie of how that works. Um, here you see a person walking. And again, we collect the trajectory. And you also see that something went wrong there. The trajectory went out of the room. but it will be corrected later on in this movie, then all of a sudden the HoloLens finds its own, there it went back. Um, but what's interesting, you see the line of the trajectory getting another color. So here we do also something with the history uh, of the data. So you see uh, when the data gets gray, the trajectory gets, gets gray, you, you will see that that's an, an older location. Um, we do this for... Um, for the people that want to use data like this, for instance, um, first responders or uh, crisis organizations, they want to send in people and they want to know what's going on on the inside. So this is not the image that the scanner sees when the, the, person, the person that uses the HoloLens. No, this is the imagery that's being sent out to a cloud solution that's, going, that's being used by the, the, the command post people so they can see what's going on. They see the image coming up in the same moment of time that the person that's walking inside sees it. It's already a little bit classified. So you see floor and table here in, in yellow, but uh, as you can see on the lower right side, you see it in the top down view. And there, we, in, in the meantime, we already are capable of finding all the navigable spaces in that same area also in real time. So I think uh, that almost concludes my uh, story. Um, so what are we going to do next is um, in these indoor environments, what we see both with laser scanners and with the HoloLens, it's not really easy to find the glass or the glass walls or the windows. So I put up a new research question to, uh, to find and detect glass in indoor environments, which is important because uh, the scanner sees right through it, but you cannot walk right through it. Um, and also what's important, and we made a mock-up here in, the, in this diagram, is that we want to really think about how to visualize an indoor environment when you want to use it for operational um, uh, processes. So how to interpret an indoor 3D environment in such a way that you can use it easily. And that's interesting because um, maybe you want to look through walls or maybe you don't want to look through walls how do we how do we deal with that with stuff like that uh, also interesting of course is blockages so things that are uh, that are not the same like the model that you scanned the last time so we'll probably we need to update it and also one of the things that we have a look at now, and also that's also in one of the student groups working in Peter's department, is that we have a way of collaborative scan. So more than one HoloLens will, will be active in the same environment. And how do these uh, devices share the data, but also share them to the central organization? Uh, that's really an interesting interesting thing, not only from a technological point of view, but also from a human point of view. How do we deal with conflicting uh, data? Um, and 
if we have time left, but I think, no, let's not do that. Um, maybe another time I can give a short demo of a environment that we made with te techno techno uh, technologies that I just talked about uh, in Rotterdam, where we scanned an indoor environment of the building of the fire brigade and that we transferred into the Unity application so that we can already experiment a little bit with how the fire brigade can use this indoor environment and how can they use it in an operational process. Um, thank you. Um, maybe a good moment in time to hand the microphone back to Peter uh, for questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Robert. Also, thank you very much for bringing us back in time. Are there any questions? Please open your mic. Or use the chat box. Oh, I didn't put in that. Okay. Tom van Tilburg is asking if there is uh, interest that people can indeed have a, a demo of the Rotterdam. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. But, oh, well, um, I, I changed computers in the meantime because of the new link. Um, well, let me find out if I can do it very fast. Probably yeah. have. Are there any other questions? You can there is a question in the chat by Hai Cheng. Uh, Robert, what do you think of Smart Point Cloud? Can it be used for navigation indoors is the question. Um, well, I must really say sorry because I don't know the word Smart Point Cloud. I think uh, Hai Cheng is referring to the work presented by Florent Pou. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think if you if you mean that, then the the combination of those two might be very interesting. Yeah, because then we already have a lot of semantics that we uh, that we can use. So I th I think so. Yes. So I can add on this maybe. Uh, yes, definitely, it's, it's very interesting and. Uh, Actually, depending on the clustering, so the first version of the clustering was based on an oak tree or voxel based um, semantic patch. So it could be directly linked, I guess, in this part. Um, but then we are, we are um, attached to the voxel, um, which is really nice for having this uh, navigation path uh, finding, but it can be problematic for other tasks linked with the architecture. But yeah, it, it should be directly compatible. Thanks, Florian, for commenting. There's a question by Uwe Stila about uh, the availability of the software. Uh, is the software available or a different from the different um, project? Well, bits and pieces are available, but not, not all of it from my side, at least, but maybe with Laurent, uh, it's differently. I think from the student projects, uh, many of them have been publishing the results also uh, on GitHub, the, the, the software. And the best entry is the thesis or ask Robert or me or somebody else, student directly involved. Yeah. I'm trying to connect to, um, to the other platform now. I would like to thank the University of Twente for making this platform uh, available so quickly because it really uh, is performing much better with uh, the participants uh, than the other platform from SURF. I see somebody typing a new question. No, it was not the new question. It was just a simple thank you. Uh, Robert, do you think it will work? Otherwise, I muted myself. Now I think it, I have to change to the other computer and make a VPN connection. So it, I'm not there yet, but it's connecting right now. But I think it takes too long. Okay, let me ask one more time if there are any other questions, either to Robert or Floral. 
Yeah, and I may suggest, Peter, that if somebody wants to see this demo, uh, I'm absolutely willing to show it another time. So let them reach out to me and we will do it. Yeah. What we will also do is organize this and send you some uh, additional information in the email on links where you can find more information on the presentations, on, on the software uh, when available. And uh, also for the next time, uh, next week, Thursday, uh, we have uh, the, the second set of uh, presentations. And then uh, we'll have uh, Marcus uh, Schutz from the Poetry, and we have uh, Jesus. And uh, two more interesting topics, but we also sent uh, the new links uh, in time. Does it work, Robert, now? No. Nope. Otherwise, I think then we should conclude. Uh, and there is one more question of uh, Joseph. Is the last solution uh, doable with a smartphone? I think he was referring to uh, the HoloLens uh, data acquisition. Uh, and could you do the same? Well, well uh, uh, not at this moment because uh, 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 a lot of noise. Um, because the, the HoloLens has a depth camera that we actually rely rather heavily on. So we, we don't de design the SLAM algorithm ourselves. It would just use the SLAM of the HoloLens. So if you have a smartphone with SLAM capability, yes, but so far I didn't see one. Okay. Yeah, it will be much harder, but technology is also of the smartphone uh, improving step by step. Yep. I see one other question arriving, people typing, so that takes a bit more time than talking. Uh, and I would really like to conclude in, say, uh, three minutes from now, because we are going really serious overtime. There's a question. It's a, Thank you from uh, Keen Watson. He's from uh, Singapore, so really at the other sides of the world. That's the benefit of the coronavirus. We can now share the online platform for everybody everywhere. Uh, and there's a question or a remark from uh, Bart Peter Smith Mixed Reality Toolkit for the HoloLens. Okay, that's the ongoing project. I cannot really. Well, he suggests to use the toolkit that was used for the HoloLens and adapt it yeah. for a smartphone. Okay, I think we have to conclude this session now. Uh, sorry again, everybody, both especially to the presenters. Uh, Florent was in a difficult position of being in the switch from one platform to the other platform. But thank you very much for persisting. Thanks to the audience for persisting. And I hope to see you in uh, a week from now. Bye-bye.